Welcome to the Compass Podcast. Today, we have a more technical discussion on leaving proof of work. That is how Ethereum, the second largest blockchain, is moving away from the consensus mechanism behind Bitcoin to its own consensus mechanism, proof of stake. To facilitate that conversation, we have Tim Bako of the Ethereum Foundation and Ben Edgington of Consensus. Tim and Ben dive into a lot of nuanced and detailed discussions around hash rate, fork choice rules, and much more. So be sure to stick around for this conversation. Uh, Tim, Ben, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited for this conversation about leaving proof of work. And I think this this conversation matters for miners because we're in the landscape of consensus mechanisms on this show. We're talking about how Bitcoin enables this democratized asset to be to be moved across um, different borders and boundaries uh, in decentralized fashion. And it's the same conversation for other proof of work chains. And it's a really important conversation as Ethereum goes from proof of work to proof of stake. And you guys have been on the front lines for years. Uh, either on the governance side or on the technical side or, or even other uh, areas of Ethereum development and seeing how we can move from proof of work to proof of stake. So thank you both so much for joining us today. It's great uh, to be back recording with you again, uh, Will, both for Compass and for old time's sake. So uh, thank you for the invitation. It's uh, great to be here and uh, lovely to see my old friend and colleague, Tim uh, Baker as well. Yeah, thanks a ton for, for having me on. I'm really excited to talk about this stuff. Yeah, and I've seen some of the stuff you guys have done in the past. Tim, I know that you've been on a few minor YouTube channels. Uh, I've loved the stuff that you've done there for kind of reaching out to the mining community because it definitely is a part of the Ethereum ecosystem that often feels like oddly ostracized. But I love how there's been people like yourself who have made a point of like speaking uh, to those audiences where they're available. Um, so just to kind of start off the conversation, obviously when merge is is the question everyone's asking. And we saw that there was a hard fork in December to move back uh, the ice age. So you, that wouldn't be a concern going into uh, the spring for the audience. The ice age is basically a mechanism that forces the developers and the community to move to proof of stake. And it's kind of like this old technical uh, buildup in Ethereum that people have thought of getting away from in the past, but it is just kind of a good marker of uh, knowing when proof of stick is going to happen. And for now, it's set in sometime in June. And so that's kind of what most people have said is like by June. But at the same time, it's a, it's a rolling map, uh, a rolling roadmap, and it's very technical. So just from you both, where are we at in the ETH2 movement? Uh, ben, I'll start with you and then Tim, we can move over to you. So from a client dev point of view, so I am a product owner for Tegu, which is one of the proof of stake uh, beacon chain clients. Um, our scope work isn't so large. Um, we're waiting for the finalization of the specification in the next two to three weeks. Uh, it's almost there, bar some tweaks, and then we will have basically final productized version ready uh, for deployments you know, within the next uh, month to six weeks. So any time after that is good as far as I'm concerned, but there's a whole uh, slew of testing. It's all about the testing now. I mean, the, the technical work is, is 90%, 99% done. Um, it's about proving to the ecosystem that this is going to work, giving everybody confidence um, and just making sure that uh, there are no slips on the day. Uh, as for specifics, I, I'm going to kick it over to Tim. I don't, I don't make predictions, not, not, not in <laughs> Ethereum land, not about the future. <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can take the, the hard the hard question here. So you know, like you mentioned, the difficulty bomb. Obviously, uh, I guess two two comments on the difficulty bomb. First, it's not actually the mechanism by which we transition to proof of stake. Uh, we, we'll get into that, uh, I'm sure, kind of in, in this conversation. But it is kind of a you know a, a blocker in a way where like if we if we don't transition to proof of stake before it goes off we will need to push it back again um you mentioned like june so basically the difficulty bomb is is not like a one-time event it's like it slowly gets worse over time uh, you usually get around a month month and a half to, to deal with it um so that like june to july period is kind of you know the the latest point where we would have to transition to proof of stake 
if we do not want to push the bomb uh, once again. Um, and as Ben was saying, you know, I think we we've we've been actually implementing the transition since uh, spring of last year. Uh, so it it really kicked off. We had this hackathon. I think it was in May last year called Rayonism, where we got like uh, prototypes done across both the the beacon chain clients and the execution clients. Um, we, we we spent you know like spring on that. Then over the summer, we kind of figured out everything that was that was wrong with those prototypes, refined the specifications. Um, we got everybody in person uh, this fall to have another kind of week long sprint where we where we worked on this stuff uh, all kind of together, co located. Um, and then since the end of the fall, we've been uh, launching kind of new test nets on on a really quick cadence in order to test this stuff uh, in production and have different clients working with each other's and 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 find any issues. Um, so the last one of those we basically launched right before Christmas. It was called Kintsugi, and um, that was kind of our, you know, first I would say somewhat stable test net for for the merge. Um, and we found a few kind of, you know, a few issues uh, as part of that for for edge cases that could happen around reorgs and non finalizations. Um, and so now we're we're you know addressing those, and I think coming to like a pretty finalized specification for everything. Um, which will be ready kind of this week or, or next. And like when, like Ben was saying, you know, from there, um, we obviously need to get this implemented in clients and we're going to run this on, on, on dev nets and test nets again. Um, but I don't think we expect we'd find any other kind of fundamental change uh, or, or like, you know, like breaking issue. Uh, for sure, we'll find bugs like uh, as, as as we expect. Um, but, you know, I... I would be incredibly surprised if we found something that like changed the fundamental architecture or direction of the design. Um, and so I, at this point, it is kind of a question of like, we want, we want to get this tested uh, one by client teams, obviously to make sure there's no consensus issues, but we also want to start testing with, uh, you know, applications and, and infrastructure providers and, we're slowly starting that, so we've been kind of talking with just a handful of them to get some, you know, very alpha testing. Make sure that like contract deployment is smooth, um, that you know, JSON RPC is working. Um, and in the coming like month or so, I think we'll we'll have kind of a much broader call to uh, to get more folks on board and make sure that you know things work as they, as they expect. Um, so I'm optimistic. Like if we if we don't have some sort of unknown major critical issue that comes up that we can get this done before the difficulty bomb happens. Um, but, you know, like, I think everybody involved in this process would prioritize a safe merge over like a quick one. So, you know, if, even if we planned to merge, you know, in June and on May 31st, we find a critical issue, we will delay it. Like, I, I think there's, there's no world in which we can like allow Ethereum to go down or to like break during this transition, um, and that's the absolute concern. Um, so I think we're we're tracking well. Things are looking good, um, but you know you don't want people like yeah you, you you don't want to create the expectation that you know we would do this no matter what because the health and security of the network is the number one most important thing. Tim, the one thing I really like that you said is that you can't let Ethereum go down. I think that's great context for this conversation. Regardless of where you stand on Ethereum, uh, just uh, as, a, as a listener or someone in the audience, Ethereum has a huge amount of capital deployed on it right now from stable coins issued by private banks like USDC to cutting edge DeFi applications like Compound all the way to typical miners who are just mining ETH, and that has a market cap as well. Uh, so in no world can this go down, so it makes sense that the merge has been delayed or it could be delayed going forward. Just You want to keep that going uh, forward. Uh, so I just want to note that as something that totally makes sense. Uh, let's go into the next conversation point, which is this new terminology that's popped up in the last few months, execution layer and the consensus layer. And this really gets into the heart of today's conversation, which is, how mining is, in essence, block creation and propagation and proof of stake with validation is the same thing by a different means. And here you guys have kind of changed the terminology a little bit or perhaps rephrase things to kind of make it uh, a little clear on which path Ethereum is going down. So we'd start with the execution layer. Well, we can maybe just go with both. You guys can kind of take how you want. What does it mean that you're terming everything or dubbing everything, the execution layer and the consensus layer versus this very 
uh, wide term ETH2 that most people have used for a few years? Yeah, let me uh, make a start um, on that. So th- the background is that what we have done is um, designed the minimally viable merge in, in a sense. We've made it as, as simple as possible using existing components so that we don't have to build uh, anything from scratch. We're not running untried, untested stuff for the first time on these you know, um, hundreds of billions of dollar network, um, but we are using tried and tested components. And those components are what was formerly known as ETH1, uh, which is familiar to everybody. And that's your clients like uh, Geth and um, um, Nethermind and Besu from uh, Consensus uh, and so forth. So very familiar. And then we're basically reusing those as is, but we're, we're putting another interface on it, but we'll come to that. So there's a kind of ETH1 side, and we're calling that the execution side. So it performs all the same roles that is always performed in terms of um, hosting the Ethereum state, the smart contracts, um, all of the transactions are processed, uh, the, the, the users launch. So all the ERC20s, everything still lives on that execution layer, which is the ETH1 client pretty much as is. The only thing we're taking uh, taking out of it is the um, the mining, the mining layer. So that, that's gone, uh, the proof of work mining. Uh, and we're also taking out the block propagation. So the, the ETH1, the execution layer, doesn't propagate blocks anymore. Um, on the other side, we've got what we're calling the consensus layer, which has often been called the kind of ETH2 stuff. And that's the beacon chain that we've had running for uh, 14 months now, currently secured by, um, I better say it in uh, ETH, I think it's about 9 million ETH um, at the moment. I won't do a dollar value because it's changing rapidly. Um, <laughs> and, but that's, that's, that's quite a lot of value securing that. And it's run flawlessly for the last uh, 14 months. Um, can be considered tried and tested. So we've got these beacon chain clients, which we're calling the consensus layer. Uh, and we've got the execution layer, which is the, the ETH1 clients. And in the merge, we are, we're bringing to them together. They're, they're going to talk to each other. Um, so instead of the ETH1 client uh, running a mining um, operation proof of work mining component, it will instead talk to the consensus layer for its uh, consensus um, uh, guidance information and uh, and data. So that's the sort of um, big picture stuff. The, the bottom line is we, we're doing this sort of minimal viable thing. number of uh, useful parts to that I've already touched on that they're robust tested components. And the other thing is that it, it just keeps it very familiar for everybody. The RPC interface doesn't change. The client software on the execution side doesn't change. Uh, you know, everybody um, who runs an ETH1 client, you know, it will just be the same uh, for you. You'll have to add the um, consensus client as well, but a big component of the system just remains the same. What have I missed out, Tim? Right. Uh, I think I think that was great. Uh, one thing I'll add, and this is probably the part where Ben and I disagree, is, you know, why we dropped the E2 terminology. Um, you know, I think... When um, when the Eats 2.0 roadmap was like, I don't know, designed in, I think it was 2017, 2018-ish, there was this idea of like the three phases, right? Like phase zero is the beacon chain. Then we do phase one with the data shards. And then we do phase two with like uh, execution environments. And that's how we scale Ethereum. And only then do we migrate applications over and like get scaling. And I think one thing that's, that's kind of happened is these efforts started to be more parallelized uh, where obviously the beacon chain development happened, went live, it, it exists today. Uh, sharding kind of got put on hold and there were some issues with execution environments as a way to scale Ethereum. Um, probably not worth getting into, into the, the, the details of them, uh, but in, in parallel, there was another approach to scaling uh, called rollups, which, which everybody knows about today, uh, which actually turned out to be, to be better and more, more aligned uh, with with the general roadmap. So moving, you know, from like calling it E2, which like implied this like a discrete transition to something new and this the sequentiality to trying to just better identify the different parts of the system where like, you know, after the merge, we have the consensus layer, which comes to consensus on the head of the chain, the execution layer, which runs the transaction. And shortly after that, you know, once we introduce data shards, it's basically the data layer for Ethereum. Um, I think it, it just helps to refer to these efforts and, and these kind of components in a more 
in a clearer way. Um, and it doesn't like lock us into uh, this has to come before that. No thought. Okay, I'm going to ask a stupid question, but I'm going to throw it out there and see what you guys think. I think most of our audience is more familiar with Bitcoin and how Bitcoin functions than Ethereum. But this execution layer and this consensus layer terminology is something that I think can kind of pour into the Bitcoin landscape. And maybe that might be a good way of kind of bridging the terminology. So how would you kind of lay out Bitcoin's execution layer and its consensus layer and then compare that to Ethereum? Obviously, it's not going to be very clean uh, similarities, but I'd be interested to see if there is an answer for that. I can I can try. Um, so execution layer is the easiest. So let me start there. The consensus layer is where it gets where it gets fuzzy. But um, the execution layer on Ethereum is basically maintaining your transaction pool, gossiping those transactions on the network, and then executing those transactions. So running the actual computation and ensuring that these are valid. Um, and you have this in Bitcoin as well, right? Like the, the validation rules are just very different. So on Ethereum, you know, you're basically, uh, you get a transaction, which might be a simple Ether transfer from account A to account B, but most of them today are smart contract interactions. So what you're doing is you're running this computation at every single uh, opcode or like ex instruction in the computation. You check that like, A, this is actually permissible by the rules of the protocol. And you check that you know once you've finished a computation, everything lines up. Like the state is still uh, is still good, and and so this is what the execution layer does. It also does things like syncing, um, but I think this is where it, it it gets much different than Bitcoin. So it's probably worth you know time boxing it there. Uh, so transaction execution. Um, propagation and also uh, JSON RPC, like like Ben mentioned. So, like if you want to actually get information about a transaction, see the computation that it's executed. It provides an interface for users to do that. The consensus layer is basically uh, gossiping blocks and also uh, coming to consensus on the head of the chain. Um, so today on Ethereum, uh, blocks are obviously gossiped uh, on, on on the same peer to peer layer as transactions. But that will change after the merge. They're going to basically be gossiped on the consensus layer side. Um, and the idea of coming to consensus uh, on, on the head of the chain is basically what in Bitcoin or proof of work uh, Ethereum today, you do with the, you know, the heaviest chain rule. Uh, so on Bitcoin, you know, you're a miner, you get an incoming block or you get a set of incoming competing blocks. You look at the difficulty on each one, you go with the chain that has the highest difficulty and you mine on top of that. And the way you, you kind of discriminate between different chains is you just look at their, their total difficulty and, and pick the heaviest one. Um, on proof of stake, it's slightly different where instead of having the difficulty as the way to uh, discriminate between different chains, we uh, randomly select a validator from the validator set every every block and they have to produce the block. And then that block gets uh, attested to or very simple term like plus one by other validators who verify that it's that it's uh, that it's valid. Um, so that's kind of, I think that's like the biggest difference between, you know, like proof of work and proof of stake and why it's kind of hard to think about it from the Bitcoin point of view, because this idea of like, instead of using the highest difficulty to discriminate between chains to find the valid head, you're like using the randomness as part of the beacon chain to shuffle the validators, elect one, um, and then get others to, uh, to attest to their block in order to create the valid head. And the, the kind of incentive difference is like on Bitcoin, you know, if you get a block, and you can like tell which one has the highest difficulty, you're going to want to mine on top of that block because otherwise you're wasting your hashing power mining on a non-canonical head. In Ethereum, it's slightly different where if you, if you get a block that's the right one, you're going to want to build on that because otherwise other validators can see that you did the wrong thing and take away your stake. So the, uh, you know, deposit or like capital that you've, that you've put to be a validator. Um, so it's just slightly different where in, in Bitcoin, it's like if you do the wrong thing, you're going to like waste energy. And, and that obviously has a financial cost associated with it and an opportunity cost because you could have mined the right block. And in Ethereum, it's more you put the capital up front. And if you do something wrong, you can be penalized uh, and the network can take away the capital. Ben, anything to add there? Uh, that was masterful. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> I thought it was, it was very good. So thanks. That was more than I bargained for. Okay, let's move on to the next part of the conversation, uh, which is kind of going through the technical roadmap. So we have the merge coming up at a, a theoretical date, and there's prep for it. There's the actual 
instant of the merge, and then we have the after effects deciding what does a healthy chain look like. So we're going to go through those three parts here, and we'll start with the before. What does prep look like for moving from proof of work to proof of stake? What things have you guys done before? I know you mentioned Rainism, the, the hackathon for kind of deciding how these things have been are going to be done. Vitalik's obviously put out a lot of blog posts. ETH2 team and the ETH Foundation team have been working on this a lot. What does the before part look like to prepare a merge of the Beacon Chain and ETH1X? Uh, let, let me speak to the kind of technical um, aspect of what, what's actually happening. What is the process of of this this merge? So currently we have two chains running in parallel. We've got the uh, ETH1 chain. It's still ETH1. It's the uh, going to be the execution layer. That's running as it always has, running on proof of work. And we've got this Beacon chain, which runs on proof of stake, but currently it doesn't handle any transactions. It just comes to consensus on itself. Uh, and the merge brings these two together. So we need a fork on each chain. Uh, so on the Beacon chain, uh, we have a name for our fork. It's going to be Bellatrix. We've got this star name thing going on for our um, for our hard forks, uh, upgrades, if you like. Um, and uh, what uh, that does is just put in place the data structures uh, and um, uh, readies the interfaces for the, uh, the merge event itself. Now on the ETH1 side, there will also be uh, a fork, an upgrade, um, I don't know if there's a name yet uh, for it, Tim. I, have you got a, something you're calling it? No, we're still still debating it. Hot topic. <laughs> Naming is one of the, the hardest things in Ethereum. Um, so there will be a, a fork uh, on that chain. And what, what happens then is uh, the timing of the merge is going to be variable because what we specify it in is terminal total difficulty. So we put a number in for the difficulty height of the block at which we uh, want to merge. Um, and because, you know, there's some randomness about, about mining and we don't know what the hash power will be at any given time, that, that might move forward or back by a few hours, a few days. Um, but when the proof of work chain reaches that terminal total difficulty, the ETH1 clients will, uh, in the very next block, instead of looking at the proof of work for their fork choice rule, as Tim was explaining, they will switch over to talk to their attached beacon node and um, say, you know, give me the consensus rules, give me the state of the chain. And from that point on, the two are in lockstep. The um, ETH1 client turns off its block gossip, it turns, it stops listening to proof of work, uh, and the ETH2 client takes care of all of the uh, consensus logic and, and propagates the blocks. Um, from a user of the Ethereum network point of view, uh, it ought to be seamless. You should see nothing. It will will continue. You'll see blocks every 12 seconds instead of randomly around 13 seconds as they are now, you know, plus or minus. Um, you'll, you'll have this clockwork 12-second block time. Um, but apart from that, you, you, you won't notice any uh, anything happening. That's the goal. It will be seamless. Yeah, and, and I think the one last thing is um, when we'll know it's done is – you know, you have this transition, you get the first block proposed by validators on the beacon chain, and then the beacon chain basically finalizes, um, which in Bitcoin term is, does not accept reorgs uh, for a certain blocks. Uh, like assume valid is basically the, the Bitcoin command line flag. But so once we've had like a, 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 a finalized block after the merge, then we know that like it's good. And so, for example, if say you're like a crypto exchange and, you know, you probably want to like halt deposits like right before, uh, like they do in upgrades, then like what you're looking for to know that things are, are operating smoothly is to have like a finalized block uh, that's been produced uh, by the kind of that's been produced after we've hit the terminal total difficulty. And, and, and yeah, uh, and at that point, you know, things just continue going on. Yeah, so Ben, I want to go back to what you were saying there where the the and apologies if I'm going to mess this up, but I can allow you the master to kind of kind of walk us through this a little slower. When the is it going to be like Geth or is it going to be another client is looking at the uh looking at the chain, looking at the block height for when a transition should occur between the proof of work and the proof of stake chain and it's going to be basing that assumption on the block height, which is variable depending on network hash rate. And then once it gets there, 
it's basically going to kind of flip like a switch and go to the go to a different chain and look for the rules from that alternate chain is there anything else that's kind of baked in there i feel like that that moment seems like everything hinges on getting that correct and uh maybe you could kind of walk us through a little more how the difficulty of mining ethereum plays into that and like the the randomness of hash rate plays into that um i don't know if there's anything else like within the rule set that needs to be discussed but that seems like a very important point is like hitting that target correctly yeah absolutely um so yeah traditionally we do hard forks on eth1 at um at defined block heights. So you define a block number and say uh, everything before that block number was this protocol and everything after that block number is this new protocol. Um, that, because of reorgs, that is risky um, for a, if you're going to change out your consensus mechanism, um, you don't want the the block that you depended on to be reorged out again. So it's um, tricky to depend on block height because it's gameable. So this is why we've gone with total difficulty as a measure because that that only uh, ever increases and you can't do a reorg without increasing it. So because of the the heaviest chain rule. So um, it it has this nice property is that it's much less gameable um, in in that respect because, you know, we've, we've got to assume that not everybody might on, be on board in the, in the mining community might be on board with a move to proof of stake. Um, we hope that, you know, because Ethereum's always been heading in this direction, that, that there'll be you know, plenty of support, if, or if not support, at least acceptance. But we've got to prepare for the worst. So we've, we've, we've assumed um, that, you know, there might be some turbulence around that, that point, uh, hence, hence taking this terminal total difficulty as a parameter. And, that, you know, that's a little bit... Um, not ideal from a kind of human point of view because it just means we can't predict. Uh, it's very variable. I mean, there's always a sort of uncertainty about when a particular block height will be reached, so when a hard fork happens. But with difficulty, um, as miners come and go, it, it can vary quite dramatically. So we do have an option to um, emergency uh, merge. Um, and we can uh, apply command line parameters. You know, we can socialize that within the um, proof of stake and uh, community, you know, the Ethereum community, and just say, you know, you need to put these command line parameters and, and, and we'll merge at this uh, different total difficulty. So there is this fallback option uh, if required uh, on that. Yeah, what, what, what to add? Yeah, go on, Tim. Yeah, one thing I'll add on that fallback option is, um, as Ben said, total difficulty always increases on the chain, but the rate of increase changes based on the hash rate, right? Whereas when we look at blocks, sure, like there might be you know slower blocks or, or, or longer blocks, but like they always increase by one every time. And the challenge, um, I, I think, you know, there's the challenge where like there's a hostile attack on the merge, and, and obviously we need to plan that. I think something that's like more likely, but can also kind of complicate things is. Assume you know the merge is scheduled um, for difficulty X, and we've like predicted that to be like four weeks in the future uh, to get people time to upgrade their nodes. Um, but then miners see that and they just decide like, oh, we're just going to stop mining. Like you know, I'm going to sell my GPU before other people sell their GPUs. Um, what happens then is uh, the total difficulty keeps going up, but it goes up slower. So maybe this like number that we put four weeks in the future actually takes us like eight weeks to reach because uh, 50% of the hash rate has left. So I think that's one thing where like, um, it's not necessarily nefarious. It's just like people doing what's rational for them. Uh, like, you know, some miners might want the front run, other miners selling their equipment and, and, and whatnot. So we do need to have some way to change that. I think if, you know, say we planned it for four weeks out and it ends up being six weeks, that's not the end of the world. You just waited two, two extra weeks and, and, and you merged in. Um, but if, you know, for whatever reason, we've planned it four weeks out and it ends up being 16 weeks or like 12 weeks, then we have the option of just, you know, changing the value. And the neat thing is also, I don't think there's a world where we change the value and put it farther in the future. So it's like we're going to set a value and then worst case, we would change it to earlier. So uh, say this value, we thought it was four weeks, it ends up being 12. So we pick something that's like, I don't know, six weeks or eight weeks, like the, in the middle. Um, That means that like, 
you know, everybody can kind of upgrade and, and, and change their, their parameter. And then by the time, you know, if, if people were just like stuck on the initial value and like they didn't hear anything, it'll have been like at least a couple of weeks that the merge has happened and they'll, they'll be able to see like, you know, outside of the chain that, hey, something's, something's actually happened. Um, so I think, the, yeah, having the ability to change this difficulty as part of the clients um, is not something we, we want to use, but I think it's like a great mechanism to deal with uh, just like really changing conditions uh, on the mining side. Yeah, I'm glad you guys have brought up a few points about how Bitcoin miners are going to interact with this going forward. And we'll get to that, or not Bitcoin miners, rather Ethereum miners will interact with this going forward. Before we move on from that, we've done the before, the during, now let's talk about the after. And Tim, you touched on it a second ago, or maybe it was Ben as well. Once you've done it, and once you have a block that passes and is on the proof of stake chain, you're basically good to go, is my understanding. Like Once you have the, next, the first block is finalized, the chain is healthy, and you're good to go. Can you walk us through a little bit more just from a development standpoint? What are the signs you're looking for? Uh, it seems very clean cut from your first comments on it, but I'm wondering if there's any more information there. Ben, I'll hand it off to you first. Yeah, there's no going back. I mean, it's, you know, uh, we, we don't have any mechanism in the protocol to fall back to uh, proof of work. I mean, that would require um, serious re-engineering. So uh, it's got to work. Um, so Tim talks about finality, which is not something that we have in Ethereum now, and it's not something that we have in uh, Bitcoin. It's it's not a property of proof of work chains. We have this thing called economic finality, which is a network wide agreement uh, or a network wide cost imposed on reverting uh, a block that's been finalized, and that cost is, is huge. I mean, it's uh, uh, a third of the um, ether. Um, securing the network. So, you know, that would cost about $10 billion today. Um, so effectively, a block is finalized um, and uh, and then you can rely on it always being there. It's never, uh, you're never going to have a, go- a fork that goes back further than that. So once the the merge block has been finalized, uh, as Tim mentioned, that there, there, there's no going back. I mean, if, even if it's um, uh, even if it fails, we find some bug, it just doesn't function. We've got to fix it in situ. We, we can't say, oh, you know, we'll, we'll try again next week. Um, uh, so that's one of the reasons why we need to run this process a bunch of times uh, on the various test nets and simulated proof of work networks and, and so on and so on, because uh, it's just got to work. Awesome. Tim, anything to add there? Nope. Uh, yeah. We have Perfect. to get it right. <laughs> Perfect. That's true. There's, yeah, a, it's lot gonna of, be a, there's a lot of money on top. It's going to be a bit a of a of sweaty palmed moment for this uh, for this client <laughs> dev uh, sitting here when that when that happens. <laughs> I'll yeah, have my champagne question. on ice, but, uh, uh, but yeah. who's hitting the big button, right? Uh, well, a, I, so it moment. takes care of itself once we once the we have agreed the terminal total difficulty, which will be mm-hmm. weeks in advance, and we've baked that into the uh ethereum one hard fork uh, uh, as yet unnamed then basically that's it we're just we're passengers then um watching yeah. it watching it happen so um yeah there's no you know there's nobody has the responsibility <laughs> it's a distributed network and it will take care of itself so <laughs> <laughs> well best of luck with that moment uh if you need to jump on a call and talk things through i'm always here you know that ben uh, <laughs> thank you let's move on to the last point in conversation which i'm glad you guys both brought up, and that is what happens for Ethereum miners going forward, both before the merge and after the merge. And one kind of speculative thought I've seen some from some miners is that there could be a general increase in hash rate leading up to the merge because miners are going to be incentivized to get as much Ether as they can before the merge happens. And uh, I think the assumption there is that the price of ETH will increase after the merge because the Ethereum roadmap has uh, done something it's promised, and you know it's generally bullish for that underlying asset. Uh, I've also seen others, like you said, Tim, who think a lot of miners could leave the network, and you'd have a much lower network difficulty uh, or much lower hash rate, and therefore less security, and the chain could be less safe for a, a period of time. Unlikely anything would happen, but it could be less safe for a little bit of time. So wondering what you guys' thoughts are on Ethereum mining going into the merge. Uh, Tim, I'll give it to you first. Right. First thing I'll say, and I've tried to repeat this over and over in every conversation with miners, is like I would strongly advise against 
trying to like start a mining operation today unless you can be profitable in like a large number of weeks to very small number of months. Like today is not the time to like buy a GPU and think you can like maybe make it back in six months. I think if you do that, you'll likely end up underwater. Um, and you know, people are free to ignore my advice, but like I, you know, that's like my strongly held belief. And I think what happens with hash rate at the merge hinges on how what percentage of hash rate is already kind of past break even and which one isn't. So if you're like say a long-term miner and like you're you know way past break even, uh you're you know like you're profitable, like you're you're basically your fixed costs are paid and you're profitable on every incremental block that you make that you mine, then your incentive is to mine all the way up to the merge, right? It's like why would you shut down, you know, because you can get that extra money. I think if you're in a world where like your uh, fixed costs still make up, like you're still kind of paying back those fixed costs, then when we get close to the merge, the calculus becomes like, say I've got like two months of mining left. Um, say Sorry, say I've got, yeah, two months of mining left um, versus the cost of like selling all my GPUs today. What do I expect to be like higher ROI? And so I think if if the network is made up of like mostly actors who are like um, still paying back their fixed costs, there's a higher probability that they try to sell their hardware to kind of get back you know those as much of those fixed costs as they can. Especially if they forecast that like after the merge, there might be like a larger supply of, of GPUs on the market. Um, whereas if what you're seeing is people who are like already have those costs covered or even have like a staking infrastructure set up, like we've seen a lot of large mining pools also offer staking services, then those folks basically have an incentive to mine all the way up to the last merge block. And possibly, you know, if they have a staking service, they have an incentive for the merge to go well and for Ethereum to be successful beyond the point of the merge. Um, so to me, yeah, that's like the biggest kind of thing. And I, I don't have a view into the mining market and like what the percentages are. Um, but if I was a mining operator, that's like the one Thing that would affect my my decision. Ben, any predictions for hash rate going into the merge? I uh, the dynamics of mining and hash rate are are very mysterious to me. Um, so <laughs> I think your your listeners will be much better placed to make their own judgments on this. Um, yeah, I think uh, Ethereum is robust against a very broad range of hash rate. I mean, we we could potentially lose uh, a lot of hash uh, and still be. Uh, extremely secure, and you know this is one of the reasons for uh, moving to proof of stake is the the sense that we're overpaying for security. So, um, so in that to that extent, I'm not worried um, by you know what uh, may lead up to the merge. I think I think Ethereum will be fine, but you know um, I I hope that miners will. Uh, stick with it, sit through to the end, and join us on proof of stake. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities to to get involved, um, and uh, I know that a lot of uh, Ethereum miners uh, have been historically very pro uh, the community, and you know are part of the community. Um, a lot of OG miners uh, out there, and I hope that uh, very much that some of these resources will be put back into proof of stake not the gpus um but uh, but at least uh, you know some of the the, the hosting and uh, and uh, and work involved perfect yeah and i think we've seen that already with a few different uh, mining pools pop up uh, validation pools as well and some of them have done it quite a while ago like uh, f2 pool launched stakefish quite a while ago and Seems to be a very successful client for ETH2. Uh, Tim and Ben, I want to thank you so much for joining us today, talking about leaving proof of work and moving to proof of stake. All the uh, nuances that go into that conversation, uh, we're looking forward to seeing what happens with it over the coming months and hopefully can talk soon uh, in the future uh, when that happens. So again, thank you from everyone at Compass. Thanks for listening. Uh, thanks to our audience for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe to this content on YouTube or share it on a podcasting platform. It really helps out the show. But again, Tim, Ben, thank you. Thank you, Will. It's been a pleasure. Great to uh, uh, be chatting again. <laughs> Always. Yeah, thanks for having us. This was a really fun conversation. Yeah.